Christensen, District 27, Hudson, Litchfield, and Pelham. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, was sorely needed. And, uh, of course, after this war bird issue, that would demonstrate why it is sorely needed. War bird, this constitution rights, Second Amendment rights, right to post and protect his property against trespasses. Along comes a trespasser with a past criminal history and uh, felt threatened okay, uh, because of the sight of a firearm, which is his constitutional right. The legislature uh, signed a protest. There was over 100 legislators and uh, managed to get him out of jail against a criminal threat. We're talking about the constitutional rights and old English common law, which we all take an oath to uphold, including those who are uh, working for the corporate state, uh, department of uh, uh, police departments, and, and, and all that. Okay, uh, and uh, without a witness, this personal questionable authority uh, and, and reputation, because of being. Uh, uh, brought under uh, legal challenges in the uh, a state, and without a witness to see what sort of happened to what there. And then the governor stepped in, and he took an oath to uh, upholding this common law constitution, and then he doesn't give him back all his rights, because what they did, they disarmed him, because somebody who didn't have a witness said they were threatened. Okay, maybe the sight of a, uh, a firearm would threaten some people. I mean, they might be scared of a, a dog. They saw his white teeth. Okay, they'd feel threatened. But it's certainly not uh, 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 justice to bring charges without a witness of criminal threat. This is something he could be taken care of by the jury, uh, and, and uh, they could, uh, you know, adjudicate it and come up with their own finding aside from the corporate law, the statutes of lives. Thank you very much, Representative Christensen. Any questions for Representative? Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay. Representative Rowe? Chair of the House Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Chairman Hood, uh, and members of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is Robert Rowe. I'm from Hillsborough County, District 6, uh, and uh, Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. I wanted to indicate uh, that this is an important bill to the House and the Judiciary Committee. And, went through our committee 17 to 1, on, and it was on consent, uh, and it passed the House on it. Uh, when the bill first came to the committee, uh, I was extremely concerned as to the wording. Um, and I modified the wording on the amendment. I spoke with the Chief Justice as to this as an issue and the wording, and uh, I spoke with many of the sponsors and supporters and they agree with the wording. Uh, it is a common law right for the jury to, uh, in a sense, on that particular case they're on, to ignore the law. Uh, this is something that generally occurs, say, in, we'll say in a mercy killing, where you have two very elderly couples, one is in absolute pain, dying, um, wants to be released from her pain or his pain, begs the other partner uh, uh, to uh, give them extra medication and put them out of their mis misery. Uh, and uh, the other partner eventually does that. It, uh, he's indicted, uh, stands trial. Obviously, there's no issue of fact. Uh, the individual in, you know, normally has confessed to all the facts. And the jury has the right to listen to the facts, knowing that it is murder, in that instance, and render a verdict of not guilty. 
this is a common law right that the uh, jury has in cases. Uh, it is with us now, and it has always been with us. Uh, the issue really is, is the court uh, giving the instructions as requested? And all this bill does is very tactfully say that it is a right, uh, at least my amendment is a right, and that the court is, in, uh, is encouraged uh, to give the, the jury a, instruction. I think it's a very reasonable request. Um, it also is a uh, important uh, platform issue of the Republican Party. Um, and Chairman Hood, we welcome you to the parties. <laughs> <laughs> so I encourage you, if you would, to pass it. I thank you. I appreciate your testimony, Chairman Rowe, and your invitation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Senator Grant. I do have a question. Uh, thank you for your testimony, uh, Representative Bro. Uh, in in a situation here, you, you, you're you're basically saying the jury and the common law have the right to judge a case and not uh, to judge it by its facts and not be bound by the specific law. Covering that fact, am I understanding you correctly? Basically, they can ignore the law based upon those fact situations if they so desire. Uh, they commonly do. Well, I won't say commonly, but they do. Uh, it happens. Uh, normally, the jury is instructed. To, this is to do the, they have the last word as to the facts, and they judge instruction as to the law. Um, I think this giving the instruction of jury notification in a case where it's appropriate is a, a reasonable instruction. Uh, the way this is written, it doesn't give the jury uh, generally the authority to ignore laws in the case. Uh, and, uh, well, it is on a case by case basis. Oh. Yes, please. Could could this result? And I understand that the case you gave is a very good example. Could this result in um, what I loosely refer to as an activist jury that would choose to interpret the law rather than judge according to the law? I don't think so. Um, you're concerned that if this instruction is given, that the jury may feel that they can, in every instance, ignore the law, ignore the facts, and do whatever they want. I guess not necessarily ignore the facts, but if they don't like what the law says, that they could then um, rule contrary to the law because they believe they need, it should be done differently. Yes. I wouldn't call it activist jury. It happens quite quite often. Um, you know, for example, worship killing is an example where they uh, accept the facts, but they ignore the law. Um, the jury has that authority. All this says is uh, that they have this power. It's given to them in the instructions. I don't think that it would uh, disrupt the jury process. I don't think it would cause an activist jury uh, is merely instructing them as to what the law is, and I think they should be informed as to what the common law is. Yes. Uh, the, the, in, in the opening, the board of the case was mentioned. Again, just for my clarification, because I've heard the term before, but the concept is somewhat new to me. How would, how would this have been applied in that case? I haven't the foggiest idea. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Would sorry. you take another question? Yes. Representative, is, I'm just looking. What is the? I'm trying. You had said you were concerned about the wording. What is the? Uh, just trying to see where the changes are uh, for the amendment. The original. Bill. Well, the amendment is totally rewritten from the original bill. Uh, 
I felt that the original bill was harsh, excessive, uh, forcing, uh, you know, it, 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 forcing the court to go too far. Okay. Um, trying to find it here. Um, and I wanted to make it uh, more diplomatic. Uh, rather than stepping over the separation of powers, uh, in my opinion, okay. which I felt that the original bill did. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Vincent, did you? You're in favor, right? Uh, yes. Speaking of. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the committee. For the record, I'm Representative Dan Ipsa. I represent Rockingham County District 9. As I've been quoted to say, you already have my uh, written testimony, or you should. It's the Constitution of New Hampshire. Part 1, Article 12 concludes with, nor are the inhabitants of this state controllable by any other laws than those to which they, or their representative body, us, have given their consent. Now, Article 31 empowers us to make laws for the general good. I would suggest, first of all, that when it says they in Article 12, it is referring to the right of the people in a jury situation to uh, judge the application of the law or the rightfulness of the law in that specific instance. I would not consider it... We, we make laws for the general good. That is, they, they're intended to apply to every instance in which something may occur. But we all know that we, our laws are fraught with unintended consequences. And jury nullification gives the jury the power to, to uh, recognize an unintended consequence. For example, when, uh, as was represented by uh, Representative Rowe, um, in an elderly couple, one spouse um, provides an extra uh, medication so as to so that the other spouse, so that their, their spouse may uh, pass on. Or uh, in the Ward Bird case, where the jury could have been presented with uh, where uh, Mr. Bird, you know, showed displayed his weapon on his property. And the jury could have said, well, yeah, by the letter of the law, he was guilty of this, but we do not believe the law was intended to apply to this specific instance where somebody is uh, simply displaying their weapon to encourage somebody to leave their own property, you know, the displayer's property. It is a considered a, uh, as I said, a common law right of power of juries to uh, nullify a law in a specific instance because they believe the law does not apply. I don't see it as ignoring the law, but as determining whether the law is in fact applicable in that instance. Uh, so I, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Representative. Are there questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, Representative McGuire. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be back here. Um, for the record, my name is Dan McGuire. I represent Merrimack County District 8, the towns of Allenstown, Epsom, and Pittsfield. I'm here to talk about um, the historical background of this uh, concept, this law. Um, and it's really impeccable. I mean, it's, 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 the, it's the very basis of freedom of religion that we enjoy. Um, in 1670, there was a gentleman named William Penn who lived in London, and he was a Quaker. And uh, he was proselytizing in the streets for, you know, favoring Quakers, and was arrested because, uh, at the time, the only legal religion was the Church of England. So he went to trial, and the judge ordered the jury to bring in a verdict of guilty. The jury refused to do so. And so the judge had the jury locked up in Newgate Prison, fined, and, and held without food. 
Okay. So the jury fought, and, and Mr. Penn as well, <laughs> uh, the jury fought their case from prison, cooler heads prevailed, and um, Penn won the case. So Penn was declared not guilty, even though, he, you know, by the, by the law, he was, because he was not Church of England. Um, and so the base, that case is the basis of two things. One is our, our freedom of religion, but also this concept right here of, of jury nullification, that, that a jury has the absolute right to decide the law, uh, to decide the case um, as they see fit. And they're not subject to imprisonment, any kind of penalties based on how they decide the case. Um, later on, this same concept's been used in, in other similar sorts of situations, as I understand it, things like um, people who help slaves escape, uh, that sort of thing, uh, where juries refuse to convict those people. So I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Representative McGuire. Questions? Yes, thank you. There we go. Are there, given the age then of this common law, are there, you know, instances where this is actually written into or codified in our Constitution or our law? Um, specifically? Yeah, I, I guess not. And I, and I guess, it, all right, I, I'm not an attorney, I'm an engineer. So what I know about this is, is what I've read specifically about this, this subject. So, you know, as to study of the law in general, that sort of thing, I, I, there's probably people in this room much better qualified than I am to, to answer that question. But, but as far as I know, the answer is no. Thank you very much. That's another one. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative uh, Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, honorable senators, for hearing me. Um, I will be very brief. The, uh, we're not discussing really the right of the jury. It's really just a matter of instruction of the jury of their rights that they have. It's, that's basically where it lies. And just like someone who might be picked up as a you know, possible perpetrator of a crime who are read Miranda, their rights, the Miranda rights, they're notified and given information about the rights that they have. So, so typically, or, or simply, it makes sense that if a jury has this right, it should be notified of that right. Otherwise, you're sort of keeping it a secret and hoping that the jury doesn't already know about its rights. Um, it's just a, a great, I just think it's a, it's a good, open, transparent way of dealing with our judicial system. If this is a right that juries have, they should know about it and be informed. Um, and I just wanted to read one little quote. Thomas Jefferson said, I consider trial by jury as the only anchor yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. So I, I believe this is good. Tremendous historicity, and um, the, the rights should be allowed to be disseminated to the jurors. Thank you very much. Other questions for the representative? So, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to note for the record there are a number of uh, individuals and uh, representatives that have signed up in favor uh, but not wishing to speak. This is goes into the public record, becomes part of that. So, um, Howard Zippel. Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you.
Good afternoon, uh, members of the Senate Judiciary. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, Howard Zibble, General Counsel to the Supreme Court and the Judicial Branch. Uh, let me from the outset state that the Judicial Branch does not have a position on the bill as amended by the House. And you've indicated that. I'm sorry not, for not right. saying that. No. And we did have a position on the bill as introduced, um, and we did oppose it. Um, and we opposed it because that bill uh, specifically allowed the jury to judge the law, which gets to Senator uh, Brown's question, and the judicial branch testified in opposition to the bill, as did the Attorney General's office, uh, because jurors take an oath to uphold the law, uh, and allowing the jury to judge the law um, runs against um, the principles that New Hampshire has adhered to. Admittedly, there are some states that in their constitutions allow the juries to judge the law, uh, but we have not. The power of jury nullification, which is clearly a power, I agree with everything that's been said, goes back centuries, um, is the power to acquit even though the facts and the law would make the defendant guilty. Jurors have the power to acquit. I know probably in uh, this country, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, the leading case on that that a lot of us learned a long time ago was John Peter Zenga in the 1740s in colonial New York. He published uh, something that was uh, seditious to the king, and he was charged, and it was clear that he was guilty under the law. And the jury, the colonial jury in New York, refused to convict him, and that was their power. That's the power to nullify, in essence, it's nullification of the prosecution of the case. In New Hampshire, what I've passed out to you, uh, since 1978, all trial judges on the Supreme Court decision have been required to give jurors this instruction in criminal cases. Uh, and I'll read from it. The test you must use is this. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the state has proved any one or more of the elements of the crime charge, you must, and I bolded must, you must find the defendant not guilty. However, if you find that the state has proved all of the elements of the offense charge beyond a reasonable doubt, you should, not must, you should find the defendant guilty. That's in there is the power of nullification. This is, and the Supreme Court has said in subsequent cases that this is a jury nullification instruction. And for example, Senator Brown's question about how does this apply to Lord Byrd's case, this instruction would have been given to the jury in the Lord Byrd case. They, if they found all the facts, they didn't have to convict him. They, you should convict him, but don't have to. Now, the jury didn't exercise the power, but they would have got their this instruction, I assume. I have not read the jury instructions in the case, but this is a mandated instruction. Um, so there, there is a jury nullification instruction currently given. Um, and as I said, the, the statute as originally introduced um, just uh, went too far in allowing jurors to judge the law. Uh, I commend um, Representative Rowe, um, who did do a lot of work in, in uh, by the way, the, the history of this legislatively is the bill as introduced came out of House Judiciary unanimously, ITL. Uh, went to the floor on the consent count. Representative Itza took it off the consent count, and it was recommitted to House Judiciary. And that's where Representative Rowe went forward and did his redrafting work, I assume with others, I wasn't involved, and came out with the bill uh, that, that's before you now. Uh, a, a much better uh, better bill and causes the judicial branch to not have a position. Uh, so that's the background. I want to give you that background. The other thing I do want to point out, in the findings and intent of the general court, um, there is a reference to um, Part 1, Articles 15 and 20, New Hampshire Bill of Rights, and the Seventh Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. That Seventh Amendment reference is erroneous. 
because the Seventh Amendment deals with jury trials in civil cases. It has no application to this uh, rights of the accused. So that's an erroneous reference um, in, in this bill. The reason why the judicial branch can't support the bill um, and takes no position is really the second sentence of RSA 51923A as proposed. Um, the first sentence is a correct statement that the juror's job is to um, apply the law to the facts. That's just a correct statement. The second sentence is one that could result in cases coming to the court um, on uh, constitutional issues as well as other issues of instruction, so the court is taking no position uh, on the staff. Thank you very much, Mr. Zivor. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Which is the second sentence? The second sentence of the proposed um, uh, change in the statute. Sometimes 12 and 13. Right. Lines uh, 12 and 13. The court shall permit the defendant or counsel for the defendant to explain this right to the jury. That, that sentence could be fraught with, with issues. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Uh, David Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay, um, I come to you as a private citizen and one who likes to fight for the, the rights and responsibilities of the people, which is why this jury nullification bill is, is absolutely necessary. Um, philosophically speaking, it is how we, the people, remain masters of the servants to judge everything as it already explained, so I won't be redundant in my testimony. But it's the last defense for the people to be judged by a jury of their peers, to judge the law, and to put it, in, like, as the Zenger case came to stand for the American juries, have the power to overturn unfair laws and defeat overzealous prosecutors. And the concept that jurors decide justice becoming a part of, of American jurisprudence. Um, the, I've heard many times that it's already instructed <coughs> to the jurors, uh, and part of their, when they're sworn in, but I have spent a bit of time more than the average citizen studying this problem. And one of the biggest reasons in, in my personal point of view, not an opinion, but in my point of view, is that often from what I've seen and studied that the juries will receive instructions so as to box them in as opposed to give them the latitude that they need. And in many cases it's well known that if you dare attempt to instruct the jury of their rights and responsibilities for nullification, especially for some lawyers, uh, you'll be subject to either a contempt charge if you're the litigant or even uh, other retaliatory action by the courts. And that's well documented and that's part of the problem. And um, other arguments have been made against it by uh, Judge Lynn, for instance, who's now on in the Supreme Court. Basically, the people aren't trustworthy. You can't be trusted with this type of responsibility. When, in fact, if you study a lot of the problems and the abuses in court uh, situations, it's not necessarily the people that are uh, untrustworthy. And I'm putting that politely. It's, it's many times it's the jurist. Because, you, you know, we have the right to do and responsibility to judge the law and uphold the law and judge the facts. So I'm going to conclude in saying that this is beyond the important. It is absolutely pivotal to keep the power in the, in the hands of the people. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Other questions for Mr. Johnson? Seeing none, we appreciate you coming today. Thank you very much. Dennis Goddard.
Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I appreciate your time. I'll be brief. <coughs> um, I'm in support of this bill, and like everyone who's in support of this bill, I have a favorite quote that yes. I feel would help. Excuse me, sir, just for, just for the record, if you could give your name. Oh, sorry. My name is Dennis Dollar. So I have a, a quote that I feel compelled to share with you. This is from the first Chief Justice of the United States, John Jay. And this is in his decision, State of Georgia versus Brailsford, in which he writes, It is presumed that juries are the best judges of facts. It is, on the other hand, presumed that courts are the best judges of law. But still both objects are within your power of decision. He's addressing the jury here. Both objects are within your power of decision. You juries have a right to take it upon yourselves to judge of both and to determine the law as well as the fact in controversy. That's the first ever Supreme Court Justice of the United States. I hope that lays to bed any question about what the extent of this right is. Now, I hear a lot of talk about common law, which is weird and arcane, and I don't understand it, and I'm not sure if anyone does. And to me, this is not about common law. This has nothing to do with common law. This, to me, is all about decided Supreme Court stages, cases and about natural rights. Our New Hampshire Constitution, people have picked bits of it. To me, the applicable bit is part first article for rights of conscience. And it's one of those nice articles that only has one sentence. Among the natural rights, some are in their very nature unalienable because no equivalent can be given or received for them of this kind are rights of conscience. The jurors have an inalienable right to their consciences. I look at it very simply. Juries have a sniff test. Does this make common sense? Are we going to find this guy? Are we going to send this guy to jail? Are we going to take some action? Is it moral? Is it conscionable? Can I live with myself when we do this? That fundamentally is what this is about. Now, the question came up, can the juries ignore the law? No. Juries cannot ignore the law. Statute can violate law. And that's what the Supreme Court is all about, is my understanding. And what this allows the jury to say is not to judge the law necessarily. It's allowed to say, in this case, does it pass the sniff test? Is this law applicable in this case? Now, there were two points brought up in, in prior testimony against the bill that I'd like to address very briefly. I heard it said that some states have this right clearly enumerated in their constitutions, and then New Hampshire does not. And therefore, it's been asserted that, therefore, we in New Hampshire don't have this right. This, to me, is the exact opposite of the way that rights work. You'll notice in part first, it talks about of this kind. Whenever we list rights in our Constitution, we usually say that they're of this kind, among them are. The whole point is that we don't enumerate them. That, my understanding, is what the Ninth Amendment of the United States Constitution is all about. We don't enumerate the rights and everything that's not listed you don't have. It's the opposite of that. Now, very specifically, I, I heard it asserted that because we instruct jurors that you should do something, that this implies, and a juror is going to understand that that means that they have the ability not to. Come on. It, jurors here in the vernacular. Should means you ought to do something. When your friends say should, it doesn't mean might be able to, don't have to. I think it is simple and clear and proper that we should make that legal term should well understood in the context to these jurors when they're about to try and do their civic duty. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gallagher. Any questions? Sure. Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay. Richard Marble. Thank you. I have some comments going to give it to you. Well, there you are. Thank you very much. I appreciate the courtesy. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to, to join with you this afternoon. Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to start out. My name is Richard Markle of 11 Dartmouth Street, Brooklyn, New Hampshire. I'm a former New Hampshire State Trooper, a former uh, insurance investigator, and I have been associated with the fully informed jury for over 25 years. 
I am very proud to display, and each one of you have this, a proclamation by our government. He has given me two prior to this one. So it would appear that the governor is supporting our efforts today, and hopefully that he can put this signature on the legislation that you're about to uh, presume here. I'm not going to uh, be redundant on a lot of the comments that have been made. There was one comment that was made, I think, by Senator Rowan relative to the, the common law in the Seventh Amendment. And the common law uh, covers both uh, criminal as well as civil. The common law existed before statutory law was created by our legislators. However, there's something that I would like to, uh, to uh, mention with regards to the Constitution, and that is Article 8. Article 8 is probably the most commanding article in the entire, which we all took as legislators. And I was here for six years, uh, until 2006. And I took an oath, and I respected that oath, because that oath says in Article 8 that all, all power residing in and being derived from the people, all of the magistrates, types of judges, and officers of government, that's are their substitutes and agents that at all times are accountable to them. And what has happened is our substitutes and agents are not being accountable to we the people. That, in my opinion, is a violation of Article 8 and actually is, a, is, is grounds for impeachment of any public officer that fails to honor Article 8 and be accountable. So I'm going to report that. Now, anything else, you have all get a copy of this. I'm just going to show it to you. You, have it, you read it at your leisure. Uh, this is two years old. It's an affidavit that I gave to the governor regarding a unfortunate circumstances involving a gentleman who has been incarcerated for 10 years. He shouldn't be there. He was not given due process. His wife and his son were not permitted to testify in his behalf. Neither were three employees that could have testified that he was at work when the alleged offenses took place. And why I got this is because the wife of this poor individual, who's still up at the, he's, he's named in here, contacted me because I was the state contact. You're going to go on, if you want to feature.org, www.feature.org, uh, and you put it under state contacts, you put your cursor there, and you'll get the state of the United States. I have counterparts in the other 49 states doing the same thing that I'm trying to raise the awareness of the public that they are not only have an obligation and a duty to do. Uh, to do jury duty, but they should consider it an honor because they are the fourth branch of government and they can nullify the bad law that legislatures, unfortunately, with unintended consequences, put through for emotional purpose or otherwise. But this case here is specific. When she called me and she told me what it, her frustration between her and her son, I, I, I said, well, well, what documentation, documentation do you have to support the assertions that should be made. And she says, I was forced to buy my husband's transcript from the court. Forced to buy it. So well, she did. Former Representative Marvel, no. I'm sorry to interrupt. If, you, if we could, the testimony, if we could get to the, the point that you'd like to make. That yeah, the point I'd like to make is bill, here. That would be If you read this, you will see why jury nullification is necessary. If the jury knew what was going on here, this gentleman would have been not, not would have been incarcerated. And so that's in a nutshell. This is what you've handed us. The you all have that. Yep, you have that. Thank you very much. I thank you for your courtesy. I appreciate your time. And I appreciate. We appreciate you coming in. Are there questions for the former representative, Dean Dunn? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that is everyone that I have signed up to speak for House Bill 146. Again, there are several people who have signed up to evidence of support of the position, but not speaking. Uh, okay, we have. Chris Thornton and we have Representative Triganza. I'll be brief. Are you are you on the list, sir? Uh, I don't know. I did sign one list. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Norman Triganza. Uh, I represent Carroll County District Two, which is Madison, Albany, and Eaton in Carroll County, and. Just two brief points, uh, which is that that HB 146 uh, is needed for when there are 
legal contradictions in the law. Uh, and then <clears throat> uh, one of a member of the public, Mr. Johnson, uh, mentioned that <clears throat> it's possible for juries to feel boxed in. Uh, and I actually had an experience like that, not in this state, but living in another state at the time. Uh, the judge actually instructed us that um, we could not serve on the jury unless we uh, applied the law as, as he presented it to us. So I'll, I'll thank you for your time. And I just have a question for clarification. Yeah. You said that was in another state? Yes, Arizona. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. For questions? Sorry. Seeing none. Chris Dorn. I'm Chris Dorn and the chairman of Citizens for Criminal Justice Reform. I have a concern with line three. It's a bit vague to me. Uh, letting the jury judge the facts and the application of the law in relationship to the facts and controversy. I hope you would spend some time in executive session clarifying what that means. To me, it could mean it lets the jury make some assumptions about the law that come in harsher than they would have if they stick by the letter of it. Uh, maybe the protections in lines five through eight references to several articles of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights that give a context to line three. If, they, if the rest of the Constitution says you're limiting the power the discretion of the jury to be more lenient to the defendant than they otherwise would, then I, I guess I'm pretty comfortable. I don't want, if I were a black man accused in any number of cities in the South, I would be worried about a white jury having the latitude to make up their own mind about the law. I think it would lead to injustices. Uh, there have been plenty of times in our history or moments where juries, where there's so much pre-trial publicity, there's such an attendant hysteria. Salem in 1692. I didn't want, I wouldn't want to have faced a jury like that and give them any latitude they want to, to invent law. I'm comfortable with the rule of law. I'm pretty comfortable with the existing jury instruction we just heard that says they should but don't have to convict. I don't want to see a bill worded in such a way that would give a jury latitude and discretion to be harsher than the law already allows. And I'm not sure if this wording says that or not. I'd like you to study it further. And I'd like some clarification of that phrase in line three. Thank you very much, Mr. Stewart. Any questions? <coughs> no, thank you very much. Uh, my name is I uh, have written that I uh, support the bill, Representative Guida, but I did not put down that I wanted to speak. Okay, if we could, Representative Guida, this is the last uh, person to speak on the bill. Please come up, introduce yourself. Um, thank you. Thank you. Just that you have new things to offer, that would be great. I did want to uh, just make a clarification. I'll be very brief. Uh, with regard to the previous speaker, uh, the chairman of, this, of our Judiciary Committee in the House was, was a retired judge, and uh, very, his, his modification or amendment to the original bill was well thought out and does not do what the prior speaker was worried about. You have now where juries are allowed to use this jury nullification. All this does is make sure that they're aware of it. And it is my understanding that there have been cases where criminal defense attorneys have requested to inform the jury of this right, and depending on the judge, they have been denied. It is something that is extremely important, and I would say it has been well thought out. Um, again, this was addressed by the Chief Justice, the amendment was. It applies, it simply brings a right forward, and it's a nuance. The, if, if it's reasonable doubt, you must find that they're not guilty. But if Beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find that they're guilty. That's a nuance that not every jury will understand. And all this does is bring the nuance 
and make it clearer. But I major point is in no way does that language allow a jury to increase any type of penalty. Just simply whether you should apply this law to this to these facts. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Representative Scott. Other questions? Seeing none, um, I'm going to just make a note that uh, I think it was fairly clear that the chair of the Judiciary Committee received proper uh, kudos for the work that he had done to amend the bill from as introduced, which the Judiciary opposed, to as uh, amended or they are neutral. There's just one thing on the record that I wanted. Howie Zibble, for one thing on the record, <laughs> yes. literally. 60 seconds. The Chief Justice was shown the amendment. I mean, I wasn't there, and I know she was shown the amendment. I would be very surprised if she said okay. I don't think she said no, but I, it's been represented that she agreed with the amendment. I'd be very surprised if that is an accurate representation. Thank you. I, th I think the committees heard hearing that the amendment was presented to right. the Chief that uh, the court has not taken a position on Correct. the bill as amended, uh, but was opposed to it as introduced. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.